All right, so. Um, oh, I just go here. <laughs> Many of you have probably. Do I need to lower the lights? But it, it lowers quite a bit. So but I'll yeah, show maybe you. Maybe it's okay. Yeah, if, if they can see, but it actually becomes. Uh, it's. What do you think? Is that good for the camera? Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, um, many of you have either seen or heard uh, this information. We have spent this entire year as a country, uh, meaning the United States, uh, debating the health care reform bill, or what is called the Affordable Care Act. Um, this has engaged our country for many, many decades. If you remember um, Ms. Hillary Clinton with the Clinton administration took this on as a charge, what she wanted to be her legacy. Because we've had, uh, since 1960, you can look at the chart on uh, your left, since 1960 all the way up until now the trajectory of the percentage that we spend on health care in the United States. And that's per capita. So it's not like, oh, we have more people who are spending more. It's per individual, per person. How much do we spend on health care? It's now up to 16%. There's only one other sector that's more than that, and that's defense. We spend a lot of money on nuclear weapons, um, jets, helicopters, wars, it, that's about 23% of our gross domestic product. The projection is if healthcare costs keep going up according to this trajectory by the year 2022, healthcare costs will exceed what we spend on defense because that's kind of flat and very few people will argue that we need to give more money to war. But this is a very important trajectory that has engaged our politicians for many years. But we seem not to be able to do anything about it. The graph on the right side, however, is what puts our practices to shame because, as a matter of fact, we spend a lot more Per person in healthcare, this is the United States in the big blue line, than all other countries that are on the same status as we are. But what do we get out of it? Life expectancy in years, 83. Look at the gap. The cluster of 19 rich countries spending as a group, in general, less than $3,000 per person, per year, on health care. We spend about 6000 and yet our life expectancy is about five, six, seven years lower than other countries. Now, um, those who are trained in public health uh, might play the devil's advocate here and say, well, living long is not everything. Maybe in America we have a better quality of life, okay? And maybe that's what we are buying uh, with the money. But do we, in fact, have a better quality of life than Switzerland in terms of what measures? Um, from <coughs> infant to adulthood to um, senior t citizen status, I think the World Health Organization has a, a program, a survey they call the uh, Quality of Life Instrument. It's a hundred questions. They've uh, administered this all over the, the world. And they can use that instrument to kind of measure things about the social networks, physical health, environmental quality, uh, support systems. In almost every 
way that you can measure quality of life. There's no evidence that the U.S. is buying quality of life for that extra amount of money that we spend on health care. Uh, we don't live as long. Maybe we will live fast, but not uh, as healthily as it might uh, appear. Uh, France, Germany, Belgium, um, even Turkey. Uh, people have come up with another index now called the Happiness Index. As a country, I think is Bhutan, that said we're not going to use this idea of economics as a way to measure productivity. We're going to measure whether or not people are happy. So they came out along with the uh, Happiness Index. And people have done that all over the world. And as it turns out, uh, when they administer that to American populations, we also don't seem to be the most uh, happy for the amount of money that we spend. In fact, we complain a bunch. Uh, about, we're very unhappy about spending this amount of money, and yet all around us we see all the disparities. We spend a lot of money. We have an excellent healthcare system at the end of life, prolonging the life uh, maybe two or three years, very high technology, very competent and skilled personnel. They get paid, the surgeons, the emergency people, not you, Sharam, I know you're modest. But uh, physicians are very highly skilled in this country, and they use their skills. But the question is, how effectively or efficiently should we deploy those skills? Yesterday, I was listening to a ranking of science productivity. The U.S. outpaces every other country in terms of research productivity. We publish more papers. We award more grants to university researchers. We have more people in research. And the question is, why does this still cost us so much to keep our people healthy, and why don't we get so much in return? If we're doing the science, we have the industries, the drug industries, but the people don't live as long, they're not as high quality of life as they could be, and they're not as happy as people in some of the poorest uh, countries in the world. There have been many arguments about what to do. Um, so what do we actually spend the money on? Just based on what I said, most of the money actually go into care of sick people, hospitals. So we essentially wait um, until people get sick. They are admitted, very expensive process. So hospital care is about a third of the 2.7 or so trillion dollars that we spend on health care. <coughs> 16% of our gross domestic product. Physician, clinical services, tests, and so forth, another 20%. And if you look at what in this pie uh, could be considered prevention, preventive health care, um, it's at most 3%. Okay? We kind of think of um, maybe uh, not even nursing home care, home health care, residential personal care. Uh, those are still about people who need care right now. The only category you could call uh, prevention a little bit uh, in the other residential and personal care, 3%, maybe a tiny bit in uh, investment in infrastructure. So when we say we prevent disease by chlorinating our water supply. Okay? We take that for granted. But it's very, very efficient, very cheap prevention. Because if you think about uh, the burden of disease globally, uh, people die mostly from infectious diseases, you know, diarrheal diseases. And chlorine turns out to be a very cheap product but the infrastructure to maintain it, to maintain the pressure that when you turn the tap in your home, chlorinated water comes out and protects you from disease. 
that's a kind of infrastructure that works. We have it for most infectious diseases. We don't have it for chronic diseases. We don't know quite well how to prevent chronic diseases, where we actually do spend a lot of this hospital care and physician clinical services, injuries and chronic diseases. So the argument has been we need to invest more uh, in prevention because that's what these other countries do. That's how we're going to bring the cost down and not spend so much at the end of life trying to prolong by a day or two, a week here, a year there, uh, people suffering from chronic uh, diseases. If you'd like to read a bit more about this, click on the link. And it's a very recently published article. Uh, you can look at how we're spending uh, the health uh, money. NIH is not uh, um, ignorant of this. Uh, the US Congress for many years is really being silent, you know. <coughs> but every time they look at the data, questions arise. And the National Institute of Health, in order to kind of have a plan, uh, established what we call the General Clinical Research Centers many, many years ago. <coughs> it was very expensive, a billion dollar budget. They established this about, uh, I think, 100 universities in the country have them or had them, uh, they were disease specific. And UCI had one in collaboration with UC San Diego. Um, even though we are supposed to uh, spread the expertise and the skills and the equipment, um, still you have to focus on certain kinds of diseases. And people developed proteomics, genomics, uh, metabolomics, uh, all kinds of tools. Uh, that were uh, applicable to those kinds of diseases. There were uh, repositories for specimens, blood collection, uh, cancer tissue. Uh, but it, ultimately, this was not enough. Uh, these centers were around for about 20 years. Uh, the concerns persist. Uh, research kept <coughs> being done. Publications came out. Uh, but the cost of healthcare kept going up, and uh, Congress was not persuaded that we were making progress. And then they made a change. <coughs> In 2002, they appointed Dr. Elehaz Zahuni, who um, got his medical training from Algeria and came to the US at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, did an MPH, wanted to see how to uh, work more effectively as a radiologist collaborating with engineers, uh, and developed a very strong research program at Johns Hopkins. And so it wasn't all that surprising when the president said, here's the person to make a difference in how NIH spends the research money so that all those publications we can actually see what their contributions are. And um, in 2004, so he worked very hard, collected a group of scientists and uh, practitioners, and they met several times, and uh, developed what we now call the NIH roadmap. Uh, if you click on that link, you can actually go to the NIH site that describes the roadmap. I don't want to do it now in the interest of time. but. There are three major goals that the roadmap outlined, which is that we have to create new pathways to discovery. Uh, biological systems are very complex. We have to figure out a way to train people to understand this complexity and to translate it into discoveries. Um, these discoveries usually happen faster and more effective when they are produced by teams of investigators from different disciplines. And so we launched a new era of what we call transdisciplinary collaborations. Professor Dan Stokos at, uh, in the School of Social Ecology is one of the people who've helped NIH uh, frame this uh, called uh, the science of team science. How can you bring investigators together from different disciplines and assure that they actually 
have added uh, contribution that it's synergistic as opposed to people just working together and publishing in their own disciplines. It's a very rich uh, uh, literature on transdisciplinary collaborations and teamwork is part of the NIH mission uh, in this roadmap. And then re-engineering the clinical research enterprise, uh, engaging basic scientists, translational researchers, and clinical researchers. So the word translational actually appeared first, I think, in this context in the NIH roadmap. But it wasn't clear to investigators, universities, uh, industry, how NIH was actually going to make this happen. And, um, <clears throat> Uh, and then they called more meetings, and what they decided to do was to move away from the disease-specific general clinical research centers to what they now call the Clinical and Translational Science Awards. And this was based explicitly on the NIH roadmap. Um, it's to make institutions work to transform the local, regional, and national environment to increase the efficiency and speed of clinical translation research across the country. And they hoped to fund up to 60 medical research institutions uh, throughout the country. And um, they uh, established at the time the National Center for Research Resources as part of the NIH to oversee this process. We're now uh, year five of this enterprise, and there are about 60 centers or institutes under the CTSA. So we are, we accomplished the mission of the roadmap to transition from the general clinical research centers to the CTSAs. Each one of these, um, as I mentioned earlier, for UCI it's $21 million. Some other institutions received up to $40 million from NIH to do this. And if you click on this uh, link, it will take you to the uh, CTSA uh, website. And it has a list of all the universities that have such institutes, what they are doing in terms of uh, sponsoring research, supporting fellows, students, faculty, and promoting um, uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. I don't know quite how easy it will be to come back to this. I always worry about clicking on a link in a talk because then it's such a slow process. But let's, yeah, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have. <laughs> um, because then we have to wait now. But uh, there is a network of these 60 uh, institutes. Oh, good, we, we can't go. so. <laughs> Let's just keep going. So there are about 60 of these um, uh, sent institutes across the country. And here is what they hope to accomplish. Dissolve artificial barriers that spring up in large institutions, uh, have a bottom-up consultative approach, and ex establish the discipline of translational research. Uh, this course, uh, these two courses that we're presenting really are about the third bullet, establishing it as a discipline. So people can actually say, I'm a translational researcher, and we understand what that means. Right now, there are, I know at UCSF, there's a PhD in epidemiology and translational research. That's the title of the degree. We have at UC Irvine a master's in biomedical and translational science. So as you are applying to PhD or MD programs, you will discover that uh, there are now uh, degrees with the title translational science uh, in, in them. And you uh, will be able to understand what this means and what the expectations are by the time you finish this course. Uh, Zahuni left in 2008. Uh, he became a global citizen, wanted to do more in global health. Um, he's consulting for all kinds of farms, and um, as I'm pretty sure he's a millionaire now because he really was uh, re highly regarded. And when you work in government and you do great work, 
all of those private agencies want you on their board. And that's what he's done. But right after uh, we appointed Francis Collins as the new NIH director, and it's the current one, and people were a bit worried about what will happen to this new translational science institute that we just uh, established. Because Francis Collins uh, made his name uh, as the person who worked at NIH to help the federal government sequence the human genome. This was a big biology program where many people thought that this is just big science that will end up in the lab and will never see the benefits for human health. There are still people who feel that way, that the attempt to sequence the human genome, which at the time was projected to cost about $30 billion, uh, was a big uh, investment uh, in just publications and sequences that nobody will uh, make anything out of. I think opinion is shifting a little bit as we're learning more about the human genome and, and all of the uh, polymorphisms that we know at, at the root of many diseases. But we're also understanding that it's not just the genes. It's the context in which they are translated, transcribed, the context of the social and biological environment that actually produce the phenotype, whether in health uh, or disease. And Francis Collins, I think, was kind of slow to advocate that message, that uh, be patient. Uh, this is a very small investment in the future. Uh, but uh, people trusted his skills. He had worked for a long time in Nigeria, the vaccination scheme there. He'd gone all over the world. But he was also a fundamental Christian who believed in God, which ticked off some of the basic scientists thinking, how can we have this person as the head of NIH? Uh, so they were a bit worried, but I think he's really now proving that he's a, he's a natural leader uh, willing to take responsibility for all of the programs that NIH has launched. And um, in coming in, he advocated five priority areas that uh, merge uh, or are consistent with the mission of the Translational Science Institutes, new technologies to understand disease, science in aid of healthcare reform, which we are now have, uh, comparative effectiveness research, uh, global health, young investigators, such as we have in this room, and peer review system on innovation. So these were his goals at the time. Oops. And he also um, said that he would really support any kind of proposal that's strong in aid of therapeutics for rare and neglected diseases. So I want you to all think about this, uh, because one of the things we'll do, at least in the graduate version of the course, is even though the CTSAs are meant to be disease neutral, it helps to think things through when you're looking from the perspective of your favorite disease. Um, tissue specimen banks and NIH's Center for Clinical Research in Virginia uh, wants it to be available to everybody uh, who is funded by NIH and students uh, to uh, support their programs. And then pharmacogenomics and personalized medicine was an area of emphasis, going back to the discussion we had earlier about chemistry and combinatorial chemistry and dr drug discovery. So this was an important part. Um, so. Here we are, 2012-2013. Here is uh, the NIH budget. It's about $31 billion. A lot of it on uh, research project grants, 53%. Um, part of it is what's funding us to do this course. But you, every one of you also have the opportunity, graduate students, undergraduate students, to apply directly. Uh, either through your mentors, uh, to get grants to support your work. Uh, I'm going to talk to the graduate students about the announcement that ICTS at Irvine just put out uh, for pre-doctoral training. These funds are for you, but you will have the skills to write in the way that reviewers like to see that you understand what translational research and clinical uh, activities are hopefully after going through this course. So that's a big chunk of, of money. 
uh, that are available for investigators. Very small amount go into the uh, program that NIH uh, runs in terms of their overhead uh, costs. And we'll be talking about those, those opportunities. So as I mentioned, the priorities, 54% uh, for basic biomedical behavioral research to understand the cause of disease onset and progression. Um, this is new one, number three here what's called the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. In fact, they just announced the director last week. Uh, this is now the home for all clinical and translational research projects. Uh, the budget is $639 million that they're uh, requesting. And then they have the Kios Acceleration Network that will uh, cost about $50 million particularly with respect to finding old drugs for new diseases. And um, this is uh, a, a, a good thing for clinical and translational science to have its own home, but people also worry that it will become relatively isolated uh, from the other centers that NIH uh, runs. And there are more than 30 of these centers, if you've heard of National Institute of Environmental Health, National Institute for uh, Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, for uh, mental health. So there are all kinds of agencies. And how they all kind of fit into the translational science framework uh, is a very important um, question. Uh, about uh, $775 million go to training. The next generation, right here in this room, 16,171 uh, fellows uh, will be supported by what we call the Ruth L. Kirsten National Research Service Awards, pre-doctoral and post-doctoral research fellows. Keep your eye on these things because they're very prestigious. Uh, if you win an award, they support you. They free you up to do the kind of work that you are uh, 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 passionate about. Uh, without the distractions, uh, but they also uh, kind of boost your uh, uh, trajectory to, to the next level. And as I mentioned, uh, we have several fellows at the pre-doctoral and post-doctoral. Uh, Dr. Sharam uh, is a recipient of one of these, uh, for example. Okay, so um, there are many, many articles that I, I, I know the graduate students will read. I really encourage the undergraduate students to, to read them as well. Um, the, the Zahuni article really is the one that started it all. Uh, this is Elias Zahuni kind of making the case for why we have to have uh, training and research in, in translational science. And following that, uh, Francis Collins, after he took over as NIH director, uh, really wanted to reassure people that uh, he's still very much in favor of the translational science paradigm and that he's going to uh, follow up uh, on it. And he gave another one with uh, Hamburg, and this is the CTSA fact sheet uh, that uh, uh, you should also uh, be familiar with. So that's uh, what I wanted to discuss uh, in a general group like this. I think um, uh, the, the graduate students, when we go back, I'm going to go into the definitions, but the undergraduate students, there's another way that you're going to get this uh, during the course, uh, especially in the group uh, discourse. Because there are many different definitions of translation right now, and it's important that we get the uh, uh, nomenclature right. Okay, so uh, I know we're, what, 15 minutes behind, but I hope it's been very useful. So let's move to our next location. I know some of you have done patient experiences either as a volunteer in undergrad or afterwards, or you've done patient experiences uh, doing actual clinical research. And I can tell you that it's kind of a skill that's learned. I, I don't know of a right way to do it. I think to say 
Uh, people are nervous, is to say the least. You know, we have undergrad research students that they take months uh, trying to kind of become uh, better at it. So I wanted to, with one of our students here, kind of demonstrate one of the studies that we do in the emergency department, and uh, kind of talk, use this to talk about some of the some of the ways that uh, either right or wrong. And this is uh, just to give you some ideas of what you potentially will be doing either next quarter or beyond. You might have already done. So I know we have varied experiences here, but I just wanted to use this as an opportunity to talk about it. I know you know the first and foremost most when it comes to uh, you know professionalism when you're approaching a clinical encounter is is a little bit you know how you know how you're uh, how uh, do we have enough seats uh, Deli? There's more chairs also yeah, on this oh, side. Oh on that side they're kind of all piled up so okay great because I know they're close to a hundred seats in here and uh, maybe not doesn't look like 100 seats, <laughs> unless you guys grew from that room back to here. Yeah, there's so, plenty of chairs in the back corner. Okay, so. all right. So one of the things I was hoping to do was to get some of your thoughts so for the students that either have participated or not. You know, what, what are your thoughts as you are thinking of approaching a patient? What, what do you think of? Let's start with those that have had clinical experiences in undergrad before or otherwise. How about our master's students? Our PhD students. Um, I, I actually did a brief internship um, under a gynoc, and the really important thing was to treat the patient like they were in the room. Um, a lot of times the, the physician would be explaining to me what she was doing or anything, but there was never a moment where we acted like, you know, the patient was always part of the conversation, like part of the discussion. If she was explaining a procedure to me, she was also explaining the procedure to the patient never excluding that patient from that okay. interaction. Perfect. So as much as you can, you know, participate with the patient in the encounter, and I think clinical research involves that more than anything, right? Because good clinical practice when it comes to clinical research is you're trying to explain to the patient what you're doing and how they might be involved in that clinical research. And what are, for those that have been able to consent or be involved in the consent process for clinical research, what are some of the things you guys consider, not the specific types of research, but what were things that you would tell the patient? Uh, that everything they're doing is voluntary. I like that. So the volunteer, any time that it comes up, they can withdraw from the study at any time. And that's you know one of the very important parts of research. Um, that they can change their minds at any time. OK. Um, if they have any questions, that they have multiple resources, either they can contact the physician or their um, like online research, and then they're, you're, they're usually given paperwork okay. along with you know their consent. So there's there's resources there for them. Okay. Perfect. How about other thoughts? Yes. Um, what was that? Great, so not just drugs, any, anything you're doing to explain side effects, harm. So you're thinking of harm, right? That you're gonna do something as part of your research study, as part of the research study you're participating in that might harm them. Okay, what else? What other things? I like that, yes. Okay, so great. So it's voluntary, they can at any time withdraw, this is not, you know, there's no coercion, make sure if there is any incentive that it's, it's reasonable and not excessive, that there's no harm, and you were talking about benefits. What do you get out of it, and potentially from a public health perspective, what does society get out of this? Because you know, people, I think most people always wanna know, what am I doing? How am I helping either myself or someone else? You know, a lot of people want to help other people, help the community, but what am I doing to help myself? Do you want to put on here? No, no, let's have Kristen do this. We're gonna, we're gonna put on our props here, so we're gonna make this as realistic. And then, so other stuff. So harms, benefits, public health uh, perspective, uh, voluntary, you can withdraw. I'm working with Jessica Vaughn. Great. I'm Dr. Kruger on the study. And, I like that. And, um, when we go consent to patients, I just make sure that they're really, really comfortable with the study. And then, um, in, in what way? What do you mean by comfortable? 
Um, for example, when we explain that they have to take a DEXA and we say X-ray, some of them freak out, and uh, we have to make sure to explain to them it's like it's only like one tenth the strength of a regular X-ray or something, and I make sure that they understand that what they're doing is really, really safe, and if they have anything, like any concerns, we make sure to address them as soon as possible. Okay, so address their questions, explain the risks, explain the benefits, but I think what you're trying to also bring out, if I'm not mistaken, is put it in their terms, so in terms they can understand. And I think that's a really important part when it comes to clinical research is, you know, providing it, which is, I think, the hardest to do for scientists altogether, and no matter what field you're in, is explaining that in their terminology, in the patient's terminology, which can be extremely difficult. Some of it's, there's a language barrier, right? Sometimes there's a cultural barrier, and sometimes there's just a scientific barrier. We're explaining it on the terminology that's nowhere close to what the patients understand. Sometimes we don't even understand it. You know, the terms that we explain, you know, one of my colleagues might not understand what I'm saying, and then they ask me, and I'm like, well, you know, maybe, I'm not sure what I was trying to say. And then that, that really involves, you know, and they actually talk about a certain English level that trying to get it to like potentially a fifth grade English level you know, the terminology, the words you use. And I think x-ray would be uh, a good way of talking about that. You're gonna get x-ray, well, what does that mean? Is there radiation? How much is it? You know, what's the harm from that? How about other stuff? Yes? Also, if there's any deception used in the study, it's important to debate the patients afterwards. For example, in like a blind or double blind study. Great, okay, so what, uh, you know, double blind or blind, what you mean is that there might be different arms and you know, even the investigator might not be aware what arm they're in, and potentially the patient might not be aware what arm they're in, and that happens, I think, a lot in drug studies, in, uh, you know, medication studies, that they want a placebo, which is uh, usually an equivalent of a sugar pill, or the actual medication that they're trying to try, and most of the time, they might not know if it works any better than a sugar pill or not. Okay, great. Well, I'm gonna try one um, here with uh, Kristen, and you guys are gonna tell me how, how I've done and uh, what things we can do better at, okay? <laughs> oh, hi, Kristen, hi, how are you? Hi. Welcome, you know, I'm, I'm running a little bit late, I got a few things to do, so I just wanted to get your signature, you know, we got this really cool study, it's gonna benefit everybody and everything, and, you know, it's probably gonna cure alcoholism altogether. So, you know, what we're doing is, we're just kind of providing some education to you, and you know, I think the benefits are just really, really amazing. So, you know, I, I just think that you, that we would all want you to participate in this study. So, what do you say? Um, is there any paperwork involved? You know, I will get some for you. I don't have it with me right now, but we're definitely going to get that paperwork to you. Um, do I get any money for it? You know. I can't remember. I'm going to go review those details for you. You know, but, you know, money, I mean, there's so much more in life than money, right? I mean, there's, you know, there's how you feel about it. There's, you know, society's going to get better. Remember, we're going to cure alcoholism. So, you know, we really want you to be involved in this study. Um, I'll think about it. Okay. All right. Okay. So, any questions at all? Um, all right. Well, I'm going to get going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, obviously I, I, I'm trying to exaggerate some of it, but what are the things that we just talked about some of it, and I'm hoping that this will trigger some other things in your mind. But, you know, some of the things I'll mention to you myself that, you know, you, you don't want to do is, you know, you want to introduce yourself. So I'll just tell you the simple ones. You know, you want to introduce yourself. You know, you want to say, you know, this is Dr. Lotfapur. I'm one of the research faculty members, and these are all the things we're going to teach you. Uh, as part of this course. You know, I'm one of the research faculty members. Uh, I was wondering if I can have a couple of minutes of your time to tell you about this study. And, you know, the patient might say yes or no. And if they say yes, you're like, okay, I'm going to join you here. And then you're going to say, oh, can I call you, uh, well, uh, Miss, uh, you know, uh, Kristen, Miss Alex, would you like, how can I refer to you? Kristen. Kristen, great, Kristen. Um, I'm, I'm part of a research study that, uh, we're part of a group, Center for Trauma and Injury Prevention Research, and we have an educational research study that helps educate folks about 
uh, the effects of alcohol. And uh, it's, a, it's a survey at the beginning that asks you a few questions about your personal habits when it comes to alcohol, but really a very major part of it is educating you as well as you can educate others about the effects of alcohol have on your own body and potentially offering you some tips through that research, uh, this uh, educational uh, research study. And at the end, we'll, it's a very private study, it's just between you and a computer tablet. You're going to be doing the research study through a computer tablet and if you have any questions about it, um, I will then come in afterwards and I can answer your questions. And uh, you actually do have two potential arms in this research study. One is the intervention arm, which the computer will provide you some educational information regarding your personal habits, or we will provide you a pamphlet. So there's two separate arms. Uh, there is no risks that we have identified yet through this research study. Uh, there's a very small incentive if you're willing to follow up with us for three and six month follow-ups of about five dollars at the end, basically a cup of coffee, uh, to thank you for participating in the follow-ups. I'm going to provide you some printed information now and uh, give you a few minutes to read them and then I will come back and uh, see if you have any questions and if you'd be willing to participate. So anyway, so a couple of different methodologies, not that the second one was perfect, but hopefully a little better. But this is, these are some different aspects. Anything else that came to your mind as we're coming up with this? Requirements of the patient, i.e. time commitments, or uh, you know, in some studies they'll do like, if it's a drug trial, they ask you to refrain from using certain ones or list all of the medications yep. so that that kind of commitment to what what the patient has to do to be involved. Yep. And I love that because just to tell you, thank you very much, Kristen, just to tell you is that I, that's why we always advocate not going off of your memory. We have a checklist for all of our research. Uh, so our research volunteers that they go one after another. They try not to memorize things and mention it even if when they're approaching the patient. We have them read an actual set criteria as they're approaching so they don't forget all some of those things that you mentioned which is what are the requirements going over the requirements going over the risk and this is and these are all the things that actually come up through the institutional review board to make sure that every study has these and patient protection is one of the most important aspects as we approach clinical research so other stuff other thoughts yes um, maybe why Absolutely. So inclusion criteria. Why is it? But you know, in particular to that patient, why is it that we've approached them? That's that's beautiful. That's excellent. I like that. Um, one thing I noticed, I guess, between the first and second times, is that the second time it seemed more like treating the patient as a patient rather than just a test subject. Yep. Um, like you are trying to get data from them, but at the same time you are trying to help them. Absolutely. So it seemed like a, a little bit more patient oriented. The second time. I like that. Absolutely. And I can tell you that. It's, you know, there's, there's lots of patient protections offered in the U.S., but really what we often forget is what you just mentioned, which is this is not just a data point, but it, it is a patient that you're approaching as a human being, and how, how do you approach them as they would want to be approached in the best of ways. And uh, I think, you know, some of the things that make our very diverse culture very difficult is some of the cultural barriers, potentially some of the language barriers. But I think when it comes down to is what you just mentioned, you know, potentially treating them like you'd like to be treated, treating them like a human being, and uh, you know, realizing that no matter how busy you are or how many things you've got going on, you've got to slow down and listen to them. I'll add another thing. Yes. So um, another thing that I found, and of course, you know, this process, it's called gaining informed consent, and we're going to have a whole lecture on this, and we're going to do this. You guys are going to practice doing this interaction. But um, one thing that I found um, is helpful when working with um, parents, because I work primarily in the neonatal intensive care unit, is pulling up a chair, you know, and sitting down with them, your eye to eye, because you know a lot of the times parents are sitting down and you come in with your white coat and you're standing over them, telling them what you need to do. It's about you know getting on their level 
both literally and figuratively, sitting down and looking them eye to eye, as well as being able to speak with them on the same level at like, the, like Dr. Lotfapur mentioned, the fifth grade level. So, just another. <laughs> All right, so we just wanted to give you a little teaser of uh, some of the things, but I'm, you know, we're really going to try to break not just this encounter down, but just the whole process of translational research through this course and through the series. And so this gives you a little bit of an idea of what's to come, and that's what we're going to try to do through each of the different series. I know we're going to try to accomplish a lot in my mind, and. Hopefully it's not too much in your mind by the end of this quarter, but we really look at this as the beginning of not just a series of three courses, but hopefully your future into the whole aspect of translational research and clinical research and how that fits in.